Yes. Hello, welcome everyone. Happy to see so many of you to be here with us. Uh, we just have a few practical things to go through. In case of fire, there is three emergency exits, two behind you and one over here. Second thing is we're also streaming live on Zoom, so please avoid the aisle if it's possible. Uh, we will also take some pictures. Is that okay for everyone? If it is not, we're just gonna take picture of uh, the lecture, not on you. Any objections or is it okay? Okay. It seems okay, good. That's good. Uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate this and it means a lot for us as students from Salmus and Gothenburg. And uh, we would like to say like the lecture will be 45 minutes. And after that, we will have between 15 and 20 minutes for questions. And you all are able to do this by scanning this one there here in menti.com. And by doing this, you are able now to start to write your questions. Enjoy it. It's an honor to introduce our respected guest for today's lecture, Dr. Steven Zunas. He's a professor at San Francisco University and right now he's a guest professor at Gothenburg Uni University. He's known for his deep insights into Middle Eastern politics, human rights, and even international relations. In today's lecture, he's gonna be talking about the relationship between the US and uh, Israel and its impact, its origin, and its global implications. So please welcome Dr. Steven Zunas. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I, and I don't think I have to review uh, anything about the ongoing tragedy in, in Gaza or even a broader overview of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict itself. But I want to look specifically at the role of the United States because the United States has been by far the most important uh, outside player in the conflict, at least since 1967. And um, <clears throat> we have all, all, and we've always known, of course, of the you know, strong support for Israel by the United States, but it's become even more obvious as the United States is becoming an increasing outlier in the international community uh, regarding the uh, extent of its support for Israel in the face of these uh, horrific uh, ongoing war crimes. Um, in the past uh, several months, the United States has vetoed no less than three United Nations Security Council resolutions um, as the only dissenting vote, but as a, member, a permanent member, you know, even a, a single negative vote can uh, defeat the, uh, the, an otherwise unanimous resolution. They blocked several others, including a, an other, uh, otherwise unanimous uh, uh, statement uh, last week expressing concern over Israel's massacre of hungry Palestinians in a food line. The United States is one of only 10 countries in the 193-member UN General Assembly to vote against cease, a ceasefire, one of only two countries in NATO. Uh, now, <clears throat> The Biden administration now says it supports a ceasefire, but it's actually what they're, if you look at what they're actually saying, uh, they're only advocating a temporary halt in the fighting in order to release some hostages. They still oppose a permanent ceasefire. They're fine with Israel resuming the bombing <laughs> as soon as these hostages are released. The Biden administration has denounced the International Criminal Court for considering war crimes investigations against Israel. Biden has criticized the International Court of Justice for investigating war crimes committed by uh, Israel and its findings of violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, the Biden administration argued against the efforts by the World Court to declare Israel's 56-year occupation and colonization of the West Bank as illegal, with the United States insisting that it was some holding on to those territories was somehow necessary for Israel's self-defense. Uh, Biden has also attacked Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the United Nations Human Rights Council, and others 
through documenting Israeli violations of international humanitarian law, even as they simultaneously uh, condemned Hamas for its war crimes. Uh, Biden administration has repeatedly claimed that the high civilian casualty rates are due to Hamas using human shields, but they have failed to find any examples of <clears throat> Hamas actually using human shields as defined by international humanitarian law, that is, keeping citizens against their will as a deterrent to attack. Instead, the United States has redefined human shields, meaning having any Hamas fighter or Hamas official in a civilian area. But Hamas is not just a terrorist group, it's also a, a government. And government employees live in apartment blocks with other people. They worship in the same mosques as other people. They go to the same hospitals as other people. But uh, the, the, uh, the U.S. government policy is they are using the, these hospitals, these mosques, these residential neighborhoods, that they implant their people there, and that's an example of human shields. And even the, even Hamas even Hamas fighters. Hamas is a militia. It's not a standing army. Its fighters live at home. So in a, a sense, and go go to the same mosque and go to the same hospitals. In a sense, what the United States is doing is declaring Hamas a free fire zone. You know where? Uh, they, uh, you know, if, uh, I mean, we've seen cases where to kill a mid-level Hamas official, Israel's literally blown up an entire apartment building. But the U.S. position is that Hamas's fault because they were using the other people in that apartment building as human shields. But again, that is not the definition of human shields according to uh, international law. And even if they were using human shields by the narrow legal definition, it would still be illegal to attack. I mean, just think, let's say there's a bank robbery and the robbers are holding bank employees and um, customers as hostage and they're shooting uh, out into the streets from behind them, the police couldn't come down and kill everybody and say, it's not our fault, they're using human shields. <laughs> Again, that's not how it works. But this is the extent that we have seen Washington rationalize for uh, Israeli war crimes. Indeed, that redefinition of human shields came on a resolution sponsored by uh, Democratic leader House Nancy Pelosi several years ago. And I think there are only maybe 20 dissenting votes in the entire 435 member uh, House of Representatives. Moving on, though, <clears throat> Biden has not reversed Trump's recognition of Israel's illegal annexation of the Golan Heights, which even Reagan and the Bushes opposed. Contrast this with Ukraine, where the United States insists that uh, we keep arming Ukraine because they have to gain every single inch of territory, whatever the cost, because uh, Russia illegally occupies 17 percent of Ukraine. And they've been next to Donbass and Crimea, and no country can expand its territory by force. This is a, uh, and the, you know, uh, Biden keeps repeating that. It's part of our, we have to defend the rules based international order. But when Israel does it, we formally recognize it. If you look at State Department maps, the Golan region uh, of Israel, the Golan region of Syria, is, is, is part of Israel. No demarcation, no slash marks, no distinction. Um, and of course, we, we've had uh, Biden officials uh, condemn quite correctly Russia's attacks on civilian areas of Ukraine. But again, it is rationalized when Israel does it. Um, we see double standards on nuclear issues. The United States has threatened war with Iran. One of the chief justifications of the invasion of Iraq was their nuclear program even though they didn't actually have one at that point. Um, but uh, the United States to this day refuses to even acknowledge that Israel has nuclear weapons, <laughs> even though everybody knows that they do. Um, <clears throat> now I can give other examples, but you know, if you want to know why there has not been Israeli-Palestinian peace, uh, we just have to look at the United States. 
which has the contradictory role of being the chief mediator in the conflict and the chief military, economic, and diplomatic supporter of the more powerful of the two parties. Because the U.S. position has always been that the Israelis and Palestinians in bilateral negotiations must work out the differences between themselves. And even if you take the position that Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs have equal rights to statehood or security, peace, prosperity, all those good things, which I do, it ignores the gross asymmetry in power between the two sides. When Iraq invaded Kuwait and annexed it as its 19th province back in 1990, the United States said, you two need to work it out among yourselves. <laughs> We recognize one side was a lot more powerful than the other, and that's illegal to invade and occupy and annex a neighboring country. And we let and the United States led the international community in reversing it, even going to war. Now, personally, I think war could have been avoided. I'd oppose the Gulf War, but the principle was the right one to bring the community together to reverse the occupation, to apply pressure. The, um, and basically the idea is that there can only be a Palestinian state on Israeli terms. But the Israeli government has categorically ruled out any Palestinian state, but the United States says, because can she keep saying, oh, it has to come through bilateral negotiations, no pressure on Israel. Um, they say that the United States also makes it clear that the United Nations should not be involved, that other countries shouldn't be involved, that only the United States should lead. And so it's basically what Biden is telling the Palestinians. No diplomatic initiatives at the United Nations or anywhere else. We will veto any resolution critical of Israel The International Criminal Court, International Court of Justice should not be involved. No armed struggle, though Israel can bomb the hell out of your civilian infrastructure. And not even, not even civil society nonviolent movements like boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. Even that, even that is they oppose. In fact, if you look at the Democratic Party platform in 2020, it doesn't even mention Israeli settlements or the Israeli occupation, much less condemn them but it does condemn BDS. Um, so again, the line to the Palestinians, trust the peace process with a partner that's refusing to compromise, a peace process facilitated by the occupier's biggest supporter. In other words, don't believe Biden when he says he supports a two-state solution. Whatever his intent, his policies have resulted in the occupation continuing indefinitely. Um, again, Congress is no different. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer, as well as Republican leader McConnell in the House, House Speaker Johnson, as well as Democratic leader Jeffries, they're e all four of them are even further to the right than Biden <laughs> on Israel and Palestine. While polls show that two thirds of Americans, including 80% of registered Democrats, support a permanent ceasefire, less than 10% of the members of Congress have, have agreed to support one. So with this background, I would argue that the tragedies of recent months, including the October 7th uh, Hamas terrorist attack on Israel and the subsequent Israeli war are a direct result of this kind of policy. They, if we had an honest broker, if the United Nations had been involved, if there had been willingness to pressure Israel, Israel will have been forced to have made the necessary compromises for peace. There would be a viable Palestinian state alongside Israel. Only 22% of Palestine, which I know is not fair, 
but it would have been at least something. Hamas has only been able to grow to be as powerful and as radical and dangerous as it has been because the moderates were not rewarded. Um, indeed, in the past, you know, we've seen how in the past year, uh, continued colonization of the West Bank, raised by Israeli forces, terrorist attacks by the far right settlers, has been going on for the past, for the past couple of years. I mean, it's been going on <laughs> for decades, but it's been dramatically increasing in the past couple of years. And since the U.S. was not pushing Israel to change its, its uh, policies, and the U.S. veto threats made it impossible for the United Nations to do anything, Netanyahu was openly saying, we can ignore the Palestinians. Hamas's attack on October 7th was saying, no, you can't ignore the Palestinians anymore. It was an act of desperation. Now, again, terrorism is not only morally reprehensible and a violation of international law, it's politically counterproductive. But Israel has used this as an excuse to massacre over 25,000 civilians, including over 12,000 children. And even putting aside the moral and legal arguments, Israel's policies, backed by the United States, despite occasional finger wagging, is not going to work. Let's think of times when countries have invaded other countries on the grounds of fighting terrorism and look what happened. When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1978 to fight the Mujahideen, the result was the Taliban. When Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982 to fight the PLO, the direct result of that was the rise of Hezbollah. When the United States invaded Iraq in 2003, as part of the so-called war on terror, it created ISIS. Fighting terror with terror creates more terrorists. And even though Biden is calling for restraint, his delivery of Hellfire missiles, bunker buster bombs, using emergency powers to bypass congressional and public oversight and the Leahy Amendment, which prohibits U.S. weapons going to countries that are using them in large-scale war crimes. I mean, um, don't believe his calls for restraint. And let me just mention, on top of all the other bad news, the political impact in the United States. You know, I mentioned how 80% of Americans, 80% of Democrats support a ceasefire. This is his support among key Democratic constituents, young people, Progressives, Arab Americans, American Muslims has plummeted. If you look on social media, I ain't voting for Genocide Joe. <laughs> the polls show this. Now, now, the United States has a weird system, as, as political system, as you know. We don't, we don't have a proportional representation. Practically speaking, we have a choice between two parties only. And whoever gets the plurality in a particular state gets all their electoral votes. And um, so even the, the, the way the dynamics work, the shift of only a few thousand votes in four key states, Trump becomes president. And the polls showing that's exactly what's going to happen. Because in Michigan, a key swing state, large Arab American population, Biden's popularity has gone from 59% to 19%. <laughs> People, I mean, again, and it's not rational, you know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, in the United States, voting is a chess move, not a Valentine. <laughs> you know, lesser evilism, I, 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 sometimes has to be a lesser evil. I'm not advocating boycotting or whatever. And these people aren't going to vote for Trump. But as a political scientist, I can tell you that they're very clear. When turnout, voter turnout is high, Democrats win. When voter turnout is low, Democrats lose. And a lot of people are going to stay home or vote third party. And so, in addition to all the other tragedies this war has brought, it could very well bring a Trump presidency. And he hasn't been shy about using authoritarian policy. In fact, he's explicitly said he wants the United States to look more like Viktor Orban's Hungary. But put that aside for a moment. <laughs> um, I want to look at the main question today. 
And that is why the United States takes such a hardline position in support of Israel. First of all, it's not about defending the struggling democracy against the Arab words. <laughs> if the United States was really interested in uh, protecting Israel as a democracy, most USA would have gone to Israel during its first 20 years of existence when its democratic institutions were strongest and Arab, neighboring Arab states were threatening to wipe it off the map. Instead, 99% of US arms have come after 1967. Indeed, you'll find the more repressive Israel has become and the stronger it's become relative to its neighbors, the more the US aid. And it's also, it's not because of the Jewish vote. The, as the percentage of the, American, uh, the percentage of the American population that identifies as Jewish has declined, and has, as American Jews have become more divided than ever about Israel, U.S. support for Israel has gone up. Uh, if you look at the three presidents who shifted U.S. policy towards Israel most dramatically, in support of the occupation. Richard Nixon, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump, they got a smaller percentage of the Jewish vote than any modern president. Uh, <clears throat> the most fanatical pro-Israel members of Congress tend to come from districts where there are very few Jews. Uh, so really, it's, it's not about the Jewish vote. And you may be surprised about my next uh, uh, thing I'm going to say, but it's not even about the so-called Jewish lobby or the Zionist lobby. And <clears throat> let, me, let me point some things out about this. For 24 years, the United States supported Indonesia's occupation of East Timor, in which the Indonesian regime was responsible for the deaths of over 200,000 people, nearly a third of that island nation's population. And the United States supported it from the very beginning. Was there an Indonesian American lobby responsible for that? Today, the United, uh, uh, the United States vetoed several UN Security Council resolutions back when apartheid South Africa was occupying Namibia. There wasn't a South African American lobby. To this day, the United States supports Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. In fact, along the Golan, the United States is the only country that's, that's uh, um, formally recognized Israel's annexation of Western Sahara, which is a full member state of the African Union. It's not a Moroccan-American lobby forcing us to do that. The unfortunate reality is, is that the United States is perfectly capable of supporting allied regimes, conquest, occupation, and colonization of neighboring countries without a domestic ethnic lobby forcing us to do so. We can say the same thing about genocidal wars. Just a few years ago, the United States was supporting Saudi Arabia's bombing of Yemen, which was responsible for tens of thousands of deaths. In fact, the United States helped with the targeting and our U.S. Air Force planes refueled in flight Saudi bombers. Again, it wasn't a Saudi-American lobby that was doing it. The United States is perfectly willing to support its allies massacre civilians by the tens of thousands. And, you know, when APAC, that's the uh, infamous, you know, power, most powerful Israel lobby, very right wing, Whenever the president has gone head to head with APAC, they've always won. Always won. Eisenhower in the Suez Crisis in 1956, Carter in the first invasion of Lebanon in 1978, Reagan in the AWACS sale to Saudi Arabia in 1983, Obama in the Iran nuclear agreement. Lobbies can be pretty powerful in domestic legislation, but you know, when it comes to foreign policy, the president has a lot of power. They can usually defeat them. Now, APAC can influence Congress. 
But Congress is, does not have the leadership role in foreign policy. They can get them to pass these resolutions, like the one redefining human shields. But these are not, but not laws that much. Um, we, we, and there's no question that we would have more allies in Congress were it not for APAC. Um, speakers would not be censored, <laughs> and, and uh, as they often are in the United States. There'd be more room for debate. So APAC has made it more difficult to challenge U.S. policy. But the overall thrust of U.S. policy would be more or less the same. Um, it would be um, naive to think that the United States would suddenly have a foreign policy committed to human rights and international law if it weren't for APAC. Because frankly, where, when has the United States consistently supported human rights, international law, anywhere else in the world? Let's, let's, let's be realistic. Um, so, so that so what so what is the reason? What is the reason? Well, let me give uh, uh, I'll, I'll give three three reasons. Um, the first two are kind of ideological. One is um, that there's this older generation of liberals and social democrats who came of age after uh, the, uh, the World War II, who have, who have a strong idealistic view of Israel as a safe refuge of an oppressed people in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Um, they appreciate Israel's progressive social institutions like the um, kibbutzim and the fact that the, 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 the Israel was run in, in, during its first few decades by social democrats that had universal health care, relatively equal rights for women, you know, all the good, good things. They, they called it a Sweden of the Middle East. Um, and um, <clears throat> it was kind of, I mean, there are contradictions, of course, even back then. But it enabled you know, Israel to sort of hide the, the, the institutionalized racism and things like that. And because it was a democracy, at least for its Jewish citizens. And again, you compare it to the authoritarian uh, Arab states nearby. And um, <clears throat> so there is a, um, <clears throat> again, idealistic you know, kind, of, kind of view. And, 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 and the, these older liberals like Biden, like Pelosi, like a lot of these people, you know, they, they don't recognize <laughs> that Israel has now gone way to the right. Again, they're more like a hungry of the Middle East now. <laughs> and they are, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and they're fundamentalist Jews are, have a huge role, and they're not interested in compromise, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, kind of, they kind of remind me of, you, you know, we all have, we, most of you might have, might have leftist friends who really, really believe in socialist revolution, who really want socialist revolution to succeed, know how Western imperialist powers have unfairly, you know, um, and hypocritically attacked them on human rights grounds and things like that. And they want to believe that to succeed so much that they're in denial when, say, <laughs> Maduro in Venezuela or Ortega in Nicaragua really are doing really terrible things. <laughs> and and, and, they, and, and they, but, but they're, they're in denial because they really want socialism to succeed. And, you know, there, there, I think a lot of liberals are that way about Israel. You know, they, they want it to work, so they just, they, they assume that all the criticism is unfair. And Israel really is sometimes unfairly singled out. But they assume all the criticism is unfair. And so there, there's, there's kind of ideological blinders at work. Um, so, um, and again, you, uh, from a distance, you think, how can they possibly still believe this? But they do. <laughs> A second ideological factor, which affects people on the on the right, is the power of the Christian fundamentalists, which are a major political force. Tens of millions of evangelical Christians see Israel as a manifestation of God's will. They see it as a continuation of the battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. And we know whose side God is on. <laughs> In fact, they even believe they see God as some kind of cosmic real estate agent that says this land belongs to Jews and Jews only. And that there needs to be an all-powerful Israel for Christ to come again, for the second coming. Now, 
According to this theology, when that happens, all the Jews will be condemned to eternal damnation. <laughs> they want them for Act 1, not Act 2. But, um, but yeah, until then, they are big, big supporters of Israel. And, they're, and the fundamentalists, they dominate Republican Party politics. And we, we've seen that from their anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ, and all the other really hardline positions that they take on other issues. Um, but the third reason, I think this is the most important reason the U.S. supports Israel, is the same reason the United States <clears throat> supports countries anywhere else. Strategic reasons. In an area where a radical nationalism and Islamist movements could threaten U.S. access to oil and other strategic interests, Israel has prevented victories by such movements, not just in Palestine, but in Lebanon and Jordan and elsewhere as well. Israel's kept Syria with an Arab nationalist regime in, in check. The, uh, the, the uh, Israeli uh, Air Force is dominant in the region. They're by far the most powerful. They, they work with the United States. The military industrial complexes of the two countries are closely intertwined and developing new jet fighters, anti-missile defense systems, and more. Um, Israel's frequent wars have allowed for battlefield testing of American uh, arms. And the Israel, Israel's own arms industry has provided weapons and munitions for governments and opposition uh, movements supported by the United States, and has been a conduit for U.S. arms to regimes and movements too unpopular for the U.S. to give arms to directly, like apartheid South Africa, the Nicaraguan Contras, the um, Guatemalan Junta, more recently, Colombian paramilitaries and various the Kurdish uh, groups. The um, uh, Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad, has cooperated with the CIA in intelligence gathering and covert operations. As one Israeli an an analyst put it, it's like Israel has become just another federal agency, one that's convenient to use when you want something done quietly. Um, one U.S. former Secretary of State referred to Israel as our unsinkable aircraft carrier. Now, our, 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 uh, we have Arab allies, but they can be overthrown in a coup or a revolution. But Israel is there to stay. In fact, Biden himself has repeatedly said, if it weren't for Israel, we would have to invent them. Because we need Israel to look after U.S. strategic interests in the region. Indeed, if you look at our history, the more, the stronger, more aggressive, and more willing to cooperate with the United States that Israel's become, the higher the level of aid and strategic cooperation. Israel, in a constant state of war, technologically sophisticated, militarily advanced, yet lacking an independent economy and dependent on the United States, is far more willing to perform tasks that might be unacceptable to other allies than would an Israel at peace with its neighbors. As Henry Kissinger once said, Israel's obstinacy serves the purposes of both our countries best. And what's kind of interesting about this is if, if, if you look at the way it parallels historic anti-Semitism, if you look at throughout European history, you find a situation where the ruling class of a given country would allow the Jewish community a degree of cultural and religious autonomy in return for doing the dirty work for those in power, such as being the money lenders and tax collectors. Remember, this is before usury was still uh, banned among Christians. And when people would rise up against their oppressors, the ruling class would say, oh, no, it's not us. It's the Jews that are exploiting you. People would turn on the Jews. You have the pogroms. Jews would flee to another country. And the cycle would start all, all over again. This happened for centuries, culminating, of course, in the Holocaust. And the idea of Zionism was that if, that, if the um, Jews could have a state of their own, they no longer be dependent on the whims of the ruling class. But ironically, this pattern is now being repeated on a global level. Initially with Britain and France, remember they used Israel when they wanted to go after Nasser in 1956. And more recently, in ways I've described in more, the United States. Um, and 
in an echo of this, you have these reactionary Arab regimes and movements, you know, blaming the Zionists for everything. <laughs> and, and while their own leaders are buddy-buddy with Washington and collaborating with this whole system as well. Um, indeed, I've been, and, and, the, and the U.S. delivery perpetuates this. I've talked to a, a half dozen Arab foreign ministers and deputy foreign ministers. When I've asked them, why are you still so friendly with the United States? You know, we're doing to the Palestinians. They always answer along the lines of, oh, your ambassador, or your State Department explained to us that Jews really control U.S. foreign policy and you can't help it. In other words, it's a repeat of the old anti-Semitic conspiracy thing. Oh, it's a rich cabal of Jews behind the scenes that are running things. It's not our fault. I've heard congressional aides saying, hey, your, your, your boss is really is actually pretty progressive on foreign policy, human rights, and he's really terrible on, on, on Israel and Palestine. Why is this? Says, oh, he needs the Jewish money. <laughs> Again, putting blame on the Jews, non-Jews putting blame on Jews for their own actions and their own decision. That's a classic way that anti-Semitism works. Um, the, um, I mean, <clears throat> and the thing is, this is ultimately bad for Israel. I mean, personally, I think it's already too late for a two-state solution. Um, and <clears throat> it's going to be, things are going to only get worse. Israel's more and more isolated than ever. Um, and it's, um, my Israeli friends are pretty freaked out about it. <laughs> you know, I, I use the analogy of, you know, uh, the, we, uh, the position is, oh, the United States can't pressure Israel because Israel's our friend. What do you do with a friend is at a bar, and they've had too much to drink, and they're staggering towards their car with their keys in their hand. What does a friend do? A friend says, no, I'm not going to let you hurt yourself or hurt others. Now, when I've said, when I've used this analogy to my Israeli friends, they said, no, that's, that's, that's only partially true. The United States is the bartender. <laughs> We're the enabler. <laughs> We're pouring the stuff. We're making this possible. Um, the, um, um, now, to conclude, I just want to, to observe that there have always been contradictions in American society between the ideals that our country was founded on and we claim to believe in and the imperatives of empire. From our very beginning, we had this contradiction of a, the, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, one of the most progressive documents of the kind in the world at that time, the first country founded on, on the principles of the Enlightenment while we were committing genocide simultaneously against the indigenous population. Maybe that's why we identify with Israel too much, so much, because, you know, that Israel also has those contradictions. But um, they, um, they seem to be particularly visible today, these contradictions. And it's hurting America's credibility around the world. As I mentioned, it's hurting Biden's re-election prospects. Um, and the U.S. in its increasing isolation is making all the more difficult to advance our foreign policy goals elsewhere in Ukraine and the like. The good news, however, is that for the first time, there is a mass movement in the United States to change U.S. policy towards Israel and Palestine. Hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions collectively, have been out on the streets. And... You may be seeing some of these pictures of the block, blocking uh, bridges, highways, rail stations. Almost all those most militant actions were led by American Jews saying, not in my name. And I have, I'm old enough to have seen how mass movements like this, even when it seemed most hopeless, have eventually changed U.S. foreign policy on Vietnam on South Africa, on Central America, on the nuclear arms race, on Iraq, on East Timor, and elsewhere. And I really do believe we can, uh, we can do it here as well.
and finally, just in to mention that you know our, our response, my responsibility as an American is primarily, primarily to change U.S. policy. But for you as Swedes, um, I, I believe you have a role to play as well. Sweden has often been one of the most enlightened Western nations on international affairs. Not enough, not consistently, but overall, I think that's a very fair and accurate statement. Indeed, Sweden is one of only two Western nations that have formally recognized Palestine. Sweden has been willing to challenge U.S. foreign policy more than almost any democratic European country. Sweden was a leader in the opposition to the Vietnam War, to intervention in Central America, to the invasion of Iraq. Will Sweden be willing to challenge the United States again? That's not up to me. It's up to you. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank you for this amazing and fantastic overview. Uh, we have almost 17 or more. We have 20 uh, questions. We will start directly with. And we have this one. Maybe you can, yeah, I, I guess, to read them directly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the, uh, Aaron Bushnell, who is the um, US Airman, um, member of the US Air Force, uh, who uh, set himself on fire in front of the uh, Israeli embassy, uh, and he died as a result, said American soldiers on the, on the ground in Gaza. Um, what are the geopolitical ramifications of this have found to be true? I, I personally am kind of skeptical of that. I mean, the United States has been um, certainly uh, resupplying Israel with the weapons and the like. And there are uh, uh, US, uh, there are a num number of US dual citizens in the, um, in the Israeli armed forces. Um, some of which, you know, may be also U.S. reserves in the U.S. Army. I mean, there are people who are are, are reservists in both both armies. So in, in that situation, there could be U.S. people on the ground, but not under command of um, of U.S. forces and not as an actual policy of the um, of the United States. Yeah, uh, you can more like write your questions if you want. It still exists. Yeah, you can do that. How many do you think? I, I don't know. It's not a huge number. It's not a huge number. Several hundred, I guess. Why does it seem like a significant U.S. a portion of the U.S. Uh, population supports the genocide? Could this be a result of miscommunication or insufficient reporting? Um, it's a minority, which is good. Um, and this is a change. I mean, previously the U.S. has largely supported uh, Israel's wars, but the longer it's gone on, uh, the more and more opposition. As I mentioned, two thirds of Americans support a ceasefire. Uh, but the, the significant, uh, and 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 the reason, I think, of course, is that the Americans are are generally, you know, they support governments that are lied to the United States. I mean, they follow the line, and the mainstream media is you know, tends to be, you know, I mean. During the Central America wars, I mean, it was also very biased. We, we would get more upset about, you know, human rights abuses by the leftist Sandinistas than human rights abuses by the right wing Salvador and Junta. Though the right right wing Sa Salvador and Junta literally killed eighty times more civilians <laughs> than Sandinistas did. Um, so there's always been a bias. Um, the um, though two things: one is somewhat less biased than it used to be both because it's harder to hide what Israel is doing, but also we have a younger generation of reporters. Uh, and also the fact is, is that more and more young people don't rely on the uh, mainstream media. They rely on, on, on the internet, <laughs> uh, TikTok or whatever, and they can get live direct reporting from Gaza itself completely unfiltered. Indeed, let me just mention something about young people. There is no political issue in the United States except maybe LGBTQ issues, where there is such a direct straight line between age and political attitude. The younger you are, the older you are, the more pro-Israel you are, the younger you are, the more pro-Palestinian, or at least more even-handed. 
I mean, that, that is huge. That is huge. In fact, more young people oppose Biden's policies on Israel and Palestine than young people oppose Bush's policies on Iraq, Reagan's policies in Central America, and even Nixon's policies in Vietnam. Yeah, it is, it is, it is huge. I mean, it's it a huge generation gap, particularly prominent among Jewish families. <laughs> Most younger Jews either don't identify as Zionist, or if they do, they're in the more pro-peace, anti-occupation wing. Um, so um, we are, uh, so it's very frustrating, of course, you know, that Israel still has the kind of support it does, but there is indeed a very marked uh, shift in, in public opinion. The problem is, is that shifts in public opinion <laughs> and changes in U.S. policy, especially foreign policy, is a pretty big lag time. And we've seen this in these other conflicts that I mentioned as well. Okay, how does APAC affect domestic international politics in the U.S.? I, I addressed that uh, already, pretty much. So, but again, the main thing is it made they made it more difficult to challenge U.S. policy. They've succeeded in censoring speakers and you know pressing editorial boards and and you know um, uh, and some congressional votes and it's made made it more difficult to challenge U.S. policy. But I do not believe they are the major um, reason the U.S. has the policy it does. How U.S. stands in the global stage be affected by the decisions they've made in regard to this war? Um, well, the U.S. has sort of been in decline for some time now. We are seeing a more multipolar world, and this will only accelerate it. I mean, we've really lost our moral standing big time. And again, um, I mean, I, we, we, I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that uh, have negatively impacted our moral standing in the past, of course, Iraq, <laughs> um, Central America, Vietnam, uh, South Africa. But um, no, this is this is uh, because this war is so visible, because the U.S. is so isolated. I think we are. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, American. Um, Powered prestige uh, is is going to be the lowest um, it has been in in almost a century <laughs> as as a result of this. And you know, there's some good and bad to that. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, and 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 it's it's hard too because on the one hand, you know, I'm I mean, not I when I was a left wing student activist and you know, back in the day, um, you know, the, the major. Uh, the major uh, forces fighting U.S. imperialism were progressive. They may have been more authoritarian and more violent, to my taste. But you know, there's no question that compared to the right-wing military juntas and brutal dictatorships and neo-colonial and colonial forces, the United States, you know, support these national liberation movements. You know, we're we're relatively speaking the good guys. But now the biggest forces fighting U.S. imperialism are reactionary. Salafist Islamist groups, the Iranian, the, the Iranians and their allies, Putin, and the like, and uh, and and so in certain ways, you know, as hypocritical as the United States is in certain way, in, in a lot of a lot of respects, you know, it is it is it is a positive thing to have a country that at least some of the time seems to support an international liberal order, that uh, again is is. Um, yeah, uh, better than this uh, again. This reactionary, authoritarian, nas ultra nationalist, or or uh, <clears throat> reactionary Islamist, you know, kinds of kinds of forces. And so, um, you know, I, I I'm not completely happy <laughs> that U.S. influence uh, is is declining. Yes, as, as even though I've spent most of my career critiquing <laughs> U.S. Uh, U.S. foreign policy, and so I think this is going to definitely hurt. Uh, the United States, and by extension, much of the West, in challenging these very real reactionary nationalist threats uh, and Islamist extremism and and other things that we are um, we're seeing around the world, and, and and that's not a good thing.
Now, you ask, talk about a two-state solution. They cannot recognize Palestinian state. How can a peace process ever be reached if they do not recognize Palestinian state and its border? Yes, that's what I've been talking about for years. It is is very clear, and again, it's it's it's, it's led many people, uh, you know, who who many of us who have, you know, for forty years or more talked about two state solution, to think, you know, maybe we need to talk about move from anti occupation um, struggle to an anti apartheid struggle because you know. It really is a form of apartheid. I I I I, I, I um, avoided using that word for years, <laughs> and I avoided giving up on two state solution for years. But if any of you've been to the West Bank recently, it really does seem too late. I mean, the demographics and everything else. But of course, if we couldn't get Israel to give up twenty two percent of Palestine, then we're not going to get them to give up one hundred percent that easily. But um, so I, I try not to even weigh in one way or the other. I mean, I think there is a tactical, uh, I mean, there is a, you know, legally, uh, there is important to still distinguish between Israel and the occupied territories, and perhaps tactically, strategically it is. But I think whatever it is, whether you're a two state or one state, the uh, principle is equality, equal rights. And that is such a fundamental principle that you'd think the world would agree on by now. That uh, that we have, that, that is what we really need to em emphasize, you know, regardless of where the boundaries are or whether there are boundaries, <laughs> you know, that that the, the principle of equality, uh, you know, need a, a, a democracy, the rights for both peoples. I mean, that that is really what's uh, what's paramount. I'll take the next one. Here you're writing a book about Palestine. Can you tell us more about what the book is about? I, I, my, my lecture was pretty much uh, an outline of what the book's about. <laughs> okay, we have maybe a question there. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the damage of linguists, um, I remember in the beginning of the talk when you mentioned the attacks on October 7th, mm -hmm. you mentioned that it was an act of terror. Yes. Uh, but if, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but for example, many organizations, including the Security Council, have not have refrained from calling it an act of terror. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That in the in the UN charter itself, mm -hmm. uh, it yeah. mentioned Palestinian by name, mm -hmm. saying that people living under apartheid or secular colonial should have a legal right to arms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people under uh, yeah, people under occupation, um, and need you know, have a right to armed struggle, but they cannot target civilians. That's very clear under international humanitarian law. Um, that, um, and just like Israel has a right to self-defense, <laughs> they don't have a right to, to, to bomb, bomb civilians. Um, the, um, I mean, one of the, one of the tragic ironies of the attacks was that they attacked, uh, kibbutzim, <laughs> which are these left-wing collectives that were very anti-Netanyahu. I know people who lived in these kibbutzim, people who've been arrested and brutally beaten by Israeli soldiers when they nonviolently tried to protect these Bedouin villages from demoli the demolition, some of them went to jail for refusing to serve in the occupied territories. I mean, these, yeah, you know, these, <laughs> these are we were important allies to Palestinians, but the uh, terrorists made no distinctions. They also attacked a rave, and these the people who go to <laughs> go to these all night uh, <clears throat> dance uh, live shows don't tend to vote for right-wing religious parties either. <laughs> so, you know, these are not, um, you know, uh, uh, again, and, 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 and personally, if they, you know, they did have bad politics, if they're civilians, you still shouldn't kill them. And so I, I have to, you know, as, as much as I support the uh, Palestinian struggle, and especially, particularly as an American, I would never pass moral judgment on people who feel they take up, need to take up arms, you know, uh, uh, to defend themselves. Uh, it, I, I am quite clear that it is never okay to kill civilians, and I have no problem with calling it terrorism. You have more questions? I have other question about it because it is isn't it very strange and very unlogical that uh, Hamas, who is supposed to uh, attack this kibbutz, uh, which is uh, friendly to them, mm -hmm. instead of attacking somebody else who is not. 
Well, they, they did attack, uh, they also attacked military installations. About, um, you know, about uh, maybe 25% of the casualties on October 7th were military. Um, the, um, but uh, it's mostly just geography that the, um, uh, that the, the uh, kibbutz, the, the area near Gaza is, um, is uh, rather arid. It's not uh, as fertile or good farming as, as you know, the, the Galilee and other parts of um, Israel, Palestine. And, uh, and that just happens to where, where uh, a number of the kibbutzim ended up, um, um, ended up being. So it was, it was more of an accident of geography. They weren't targeted deliberately um, because, they were, because they were kibbutzim. Question? Do you have yeah. a question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I had a question about uh, the people of Gaza. So this conflict doesn't seem to simmer down even after a lot of uh, the world community is saying, what happens to the people of Gaza now? Because uh, Israel is going to advancing into uh, the Gaza territories and the people are fleeing away and they're they getting bombed. And the neighboring countries are also not accepting Gazans, mm -hmm. which is also counterproductive because once you leave, you're never going to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the, in the context of like 10 years, 15 years, what is actually going to happen to the people there? I, I don't know. It is. I mean, the, the humanitarian tragedy is, is incredible. And the, the idea that they're still threatening to attack Rafa, um, you know, when you have uh, 1.4 million people crowded in this tiny area with nowhere to go, I mean, again, it, it is, um, uh, and, and I mean, uh, it, 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 um, and, and, and also I should mention that Israel has been, even areas where the Hamas fighters have left, civilians have left, they've been systematically blowing up buildings. Every university in Gaza has been virtually destroyed. All, any, any and all, they're, they're basically trying to just destroy any possibility of, of rebuilding civil uh, uh, life. And the U.S. says, "Oh, the rich Gulf states will come and rebuild things and whatever." You know, it's, and it's not not going to happen. It, it is, um, yeah, it, it, um, yeah, it is horrible. I, I, I wish I knew, and I, or maybe I don't wish. I wish I wish. I'm maybe I'm glad I don't know <laughs> because it's, uh, yeah, it's real, uh, yeah, it's terrible. Just to add to that, because you mentioned every university in Gaza is gone. Uh, the Palestinians are saying that they are occupied. I think the World Academic Committee and also from academics. Most of them are the world community came together and accepted Ukrainian students, mm -hmm. which is perfectly right. Yeah. But I haven't seen a single post, at least from universities or from labs, yeah. or from research organizations, mm -hmm. helping these students yeah. or the researchers to mm -hmm. complete their research mm -hmm. or invite students. This is, yeah. This is yeah, I mean, part, part of the thing is that, that the Palestinian students in Gaza can't get out at this point. But uh, yeah, the fact that we have, hadn't even offered to help Palestinians are already here. And also, remember, remember a couple of years ago, and even to this day, you see Ukrainian flags all over the place. Any Palestinian flags are ones that are being waved by students, um, mostly Palestinian students, <laughs> and not uh, and, and the, the universities, other establishments have not shown the um, same kind of, of solidarity. And that, that double standard is pretty, pretty glaring, but it's not new. I mean, Look at all the Ukrainian refugees welcomed into Poland and other countries compared to the way they've, they've treated uh, refugees from Syria or Afghanistan or, or, uh, or other countries. It's, it's the same underlying racism, frankly. I would just like to make it in a fair way. We will take questions from here. And... Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for pointing out that double standard. Thank you for pointing out that double Yeah, it, 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 uh, uh, yeah, and, and um, See, yeah, yeah. No, the, the, no, no, no. The, the international humanitarian law, Fourth Geneva Conventions, 1949. You can look it up. 
uh, it is illegal to attack non-combatants. I mean, that's, that's very, very clear, whether you're a government or an irregular armed group, uh, you know, non-combatants uh, cannot be attacked. The, the, I mentioned the World Court decision. They said, you know, the United States said, oh, it's denying Israel's right to self-defense. Um, but if you actually read the, the, read the, uh, th the, the state, the, the, the decision, it explicitly said Israel does have a right to self-defense. They can build a wall, like any country can build a wall, on its internationally recognized border. They cannot build a wall in a serpentine fashion deep inside occupied territories to incorporate, incorporate uh, these illegal settlements. Now, the, the, what they meant was it didn't say, okay, so it's therefore okay to kill the settlers. What they were saying was the settlers should get the hell out of West Bank and go back to Israel. If you feel like the question that we're showing here is yours, so just you want to add anything, just like uh, show a hand. I think there are two more questions. But we will there's take there's still, are there still more in there? Yeah, there's more questions. We will take one from here and one from mm -hmm. Shall we come back to you later? Yeah, we will. Why did the current administration not anticipate that backing Israel could lead to a loss in the forthcoming elections? Um, <clears throat> well, until recently, um, supporting Israel was a political plus. Um, it, was, uh, it turned off some voters, but it was uh, it, for most voters, it either didn't matter or it made them more likely to support the candidate. Um, but there's been a big shift, again, especially among younger voters. And Biden, who's kind of an old guy, as you probably noticed, <laughs> who came of age when there was this broad consensus of supporting Israel and it help him politically and things like that, hasn't gotten the memo. I really think that he's, he's basically um, <laughs> eluding himself, deluding himself. I mean, he really, I don't think he re really realizes just how serious this is. I mean, I mean I, I, I'm amazed uh, all these, uh, uh, you know, my, 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 um, a lot of my students, two of my three children who are in their thir early 30s, early mid 30s, um, and uh, a lot of their friends, you know, that, I mean, yeah, again, they are, they're, they're furious at Biden. I mean, in incredibly so. And again, the turnout is critically important. In fact, even if a week before the election looks like Trump's going to win and people say, oh my God, I better vote for Biden anyway. These, pe these people will not have gone door to door trying to get the, the vote. Voter turnout. Voter turnout is kind of low in the United States, even for national elections, only about 60 percent. So it's really critical to get people out of their homes to go vote. And, all, and you have to register. I mean, it's kind of a complicated process. So you need a lot of volunteers. You need and to have volunteers. You have a lot of enthusiasm. And so even if a lot, a lot of these young people do vote for Biden anyway, hold their nose and, you know, pull the lever. They're not going to be doing all this little extra work that you need to do that they would otherwise do. So again, I, I really, I, I, I'm shaking my head. A lot of people are, and a lot of uh, Democratic Party activists are pretty freaking out about this, honestly. Like, what, what, that, that's why Biden is starting to say, oh, I support a ceasefire, when it's not really a ceasefire. Uh, when he's starting to speak more and more about how Israel shouldn't do this indiscriminate bombing, even though he isn't doing anything. I mean, the very fact there's been a shift in rhetoric shows that he's, getting somewhat concerned, but I, I don't think it's going to save him. Do have a question, Dave? Uh, I mean, besides all the double standards that the U.S. government is doing when in the face of the Israeli and uh, Palestinian conflict, which I don't name it as that, but how would you elaborate on uh, uh, the West, other Western countries, Western uh, governments, backing the U.S.? Because the U.S. could not only work to war itself without having other Western governments backing it up as mm -hmm. Great Britain or France. I mean, we have seen it in Yemen last mm -hmm. time because they, they couldn't back countries alone. Yeah. They would have need someone else. Yeah. How would you elaborate on I mean, I, mean I, I, I think in terms of the Red Sea, I mean, I think there's a... Um... Oh, yeah, it's about uh, why, why, why the Europeans and others haven't um, you know, been uh, taking a stronger stance and why they seem to be following the lead of the United States. And he gave the example of bombing the Houthis uh, at, for, for uh, interrupting uh, Red Sea shipping. I mean, I think, I think, uh, I mean, um, 
one can I mean one can understand why the Houthis are attacking Red Sea shipping. You can talk about the hypocrisy of the United States saying we need to stand up for international maritime law when we don't care about international law when it comes to the people of Gaza. Not to mention the fact the United States isn't even a party to the Law of the Sea Treaty. That's another story. <laughs> um, but um, but you know I think you know one can make a, a case that you know shelling international shipping in, is is illegal. And they're just enforcing international law there. Um, what's harder to understand is why there hasn't been a stronger um, um, position in, 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 in demanding a, a ceasefire. We've seen Spain, we've seen Ireland, we've seen Mer uh, Belgium, we've seen a number of countries uh, speaking out. But um, uh, you know that, that you know I mentioned there are only only one other NATO country, Czech Republic, uh, voted against a ceasefire. But um, at least half the European countries abstained, you know. So, um, yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is pretty. Uh, it is pretty disappointing. And to be honest, I don't know European politics well enough to give you a full analysis as to why. Yes, yeah. I will take more questions from yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, is it possible yeah. to talk a bit louder so the people? Exactly. This is this is what the idea yeah. of having mentee. Yeah. So and we it, all see the priority. Process. Those written down though. Yeah, there's a lot here, but like we take that one okay. and okay. we continue here. Yeah. So um, it's I do understand that the aid that uh, the USA gives mm -hmm. uh, might be important. But how important is it? Yeah. Will if they um, unilaterally decide to stop all mm -hmm. help to Israel, will that be enough to stop um, Israel from attacking? Because I understand that over seventy percent of all Israelis support this. Yes, yes, yeah. they have. I mean, Israel. Um, Israel has its own domestic arms industry. Uh, it's quite quite significant. And but you know there there are particular kinds of missiles and bombs, and they've been using them up at a rapid rate, as we know. That do come, that can only be obtained from the United States. Uh, there's also certain um, uh, military technologies that the U.S. could withhold that could jam up the system. Um, and uh, so you know, um, and they so, so they keep fighting, but not nearly as devastating. I think more 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 important, but I think also importantly, from not just physically providing them with the means of killing people, is that by cutting aid. It'll show are really serious, and there are a lot of this. I mean, a lot of Israelis can support their government what it's doing because they know they have the blank check of the United States. Without that, they have to. Uh oh, you know. <laughs> I mean, if you're in a fight and there's a big guy backing you, you know, you're going to keep fighting. But if you turn around and they're not there anymore, you know, <laughs> you know, you're you're in a, you might be a little more uh, uh, more hesitant. And um, so, yeah, I I I think it really would have an impact. And by the way, just let me let me just make a little aside about USAID. You know, a lot of America, some Americans are really upset that we spend over three billion dollars of military aid, or almost four billion dollars of military aid every year to Israel, even though they're a fairly wealthy country. The standard of living is almost as high as Europe and the United States. Um, and um, and 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 Biden's pushing an additional ten billion dollars uh, to help them fight the Gaza war. And people say, oh, why are we doing all of Israel? They have they have universal health care. They have all these things we don't have. You know, why are we giving them money? But the fact is that over 80 percent of USA to Israel goes to American arms manufacturers. You know, this is uh, and, 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 uh, and I, I talk and, and, and a lot of it is stuff that Israel doesn't even need is trying to keep the assembly lines running. <laughs> and so, you know, like, like it, it's not a simple matter of all oh, those Israelis are taking our money because most Israelis don't see that money. You know, again, this is where I talk about the military industrial complexes of the two countries and they're uh, being, being intertwined. But on the immediate level, yes, a lot of this aid really is being used. This $10 billion supplement really is specifically for things that are aimed at the people of Gaza. But couldn't this uh, also have the opposite? people now see that okay now we're like the Israelis see that now they are completely alone on the, on the international scale and then maybe not use the um, high-end weapons but even more of the dumb bombs um again I, I the Israelis really haven't been showing much restraint period so I really don't think it could be worse really don't <laughs> yeah I would just mention again if you have questions just write it in Menti this is because we like we can all see the question here in the uh, in the screen. I'm so sorry. Oh, shit. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.
It's fine. I thought it was, it was for it. I always saw that. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. I guess. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Do you believe that the Israeli state has a legal right to exist, being built where people existed? If not, what solution would you propose? If you believe it, it does legally. Why? Well. Um. Uh, if you want to tune in uh, tomorrow at uh, four o'clock, um, I'm going to be on a panel about uh, colonial settlerism. That's sponsored uh, by the University of Lund, but it's it's remote. Um, you can look look that up, and you know some of this will be um, addressed. Um, I mean, legally, Israel exists, and we can argue whether it was it was right thing to establish Israel, and we can debate the legitimacy of Zionism and all that. Uh, but again, under international law, as a recognized nation state, you know, um, legally, it does have a right to exist. Um, when, again, one can argue morally, you can argue a lot of that other things. Legal. Yeah, uh, it doesn't come up recently yeah. the actual establishment of the state of Israel yeah. was never legal. Mm -hmm. So we can't be using the argument there because it's just. Legal. Yeah, I, I, again, the, the, um, <clears throat> again, we can you know, also argue whether the General Assembly had the power to do that and things like that. But again, a lot of nation, a lot of nation states in the world were established outside of international legal norms. And so I'm talking about, uh, for, for, for better or worse, you know, what, uh, you know, what happens here or, 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 or you know, that, 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 that's what happens. But look, it's not me to argue this. What, what I'm trying to, 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 to focus on is actually, you know, that I think we're actually in a stronger position if we basically talk about human rights and international law and, 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 and avoid divisive arguments about the nature of Zionism or whether Israel... Israel's legal or that kind of thing. Again, I'm not saying these aren't important questions, but again, I think what, what's, uh, what, what's impo uh, important right now is to, to uh, recognize that the United States, with the collusion of Europe and others, is, 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 is enabling war crimes on a genocidal portion that has to stop, and there has to be a settlement that recognizes the legitimate rights of both peoples, whether it be in one state or two state, and that and and uh, and and, and I, I'm here today to try to explain what the United States position is, not to take a position one way or the other on some of these questions. Yeah, I will just inform you. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah, I want to just inform you. We have three, take three questions. You are free to like yeah. give answer, like short answer to state. Yeah, yeah. You want okay. because we have a limited time actually. Well, it'd be required for us to change its position. I think it's going to have to be. Uh, civil society. It's going to have to be popular protests, popular movements uh, like the ones I have. Um, I've, um, I guess we, you talked about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and the, the International Court of Justice will um, decide. Uh, it has has said there are plausible um, a case for genocide, but the um, actual ruling uh, is probably uh, another year or two away. Um, but, you know, the United States has rejected previous uh, rulings by the World Court, such as the one about the, uh, the separation wall. They're also uh, uh, ignoring the, um, the, the, the ruling that nuclear weapons are illegal. Um, so, I, I, unfortunately, I don't think it will make a, make a huge difference, but it will isolate Israel uh, uh, further. And I think in that case, it will you know, perhaps you know, move the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the international community to, to act. Yeah. Um, um, I don't. I don't. I don't think this is the, this is the um, major issue. Obviously, there's Islamophobes and others who will talk about replacement theory and Muslims taking over and that kind of thing. But I think even even the more hardline pro-Israel people uh, don't um, are, aren't um, uh, aren't too worried about about that because it's really really um, uh, not an issue. Uh, particularly in the United States, where, where the Muslim community in the United States is largely middle class. These are professionals. These are business people. Um, and, uh, and, and, and they, they've, uh, they've assimilated into American society. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and, and um, it, it's, it's different than what you find, um, very different than what you find here in Europe. So uh, uh, despite, and so in certain ways, Islamophobia is even somewhat less in the United States. <laughs> Than, uh, than you're finding in many European countries, despite all the other things the U.S. does. Yeah, they tell you, they, I will, we, will, yeah, we will go with this one state. Yeah.
Sorry for this, but we don't have time. Um, mentioned some criticism of Israel's unfair, what are some of the unfair uh, accusations? Um, it's less a matter of being uh, un unfair, but had double standards. I mean, people who uh, who, who uh, correctly uh, condemn U.S. war crimes in, um, uh, in Gaza, but then defend Assad and his war crimes on, on, um, on Syrian uh, cities, or oppose the um, um, Israeli occupation, but then defend Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara, or, um, or, or you know, other, other cases where um, um, you know, there, there's, there, you know, where we see double standards going from the other direction. That's primarily, primarily what I meant. Um, Palestine is liberated. Um, I really, I don't think they will, uh, I, um, well, uh, Israel, uh, Palestine is not going to be liberated, uh, liberated by armed force. Israel is always going to have, it's going to have to be some kind of negotiated uh, settlement and a negotiated settlement uh, would definitely allow Israelis to stay. Um, I don't see, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's going to be like South Africa. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to come down to, uh, negotiations, uh, and, uh, but that you know, does guarantee the rights of, uh, of, of, of minorities. And so I don't think there's any, um, uh, any threat of Israel uh, be, Israelis being forced to leave. And one thing I'm gonna point out in the, in the program on colonial settlerism um, is that um, the, um, um, is that though, though there's a lot of ways that Israel does meet the definition of a colonial settler state, it's not like the French in Algeria or the uh, British in Rhodesia or Kenya or the Portuguese in Mozambique or Angola, where upon liberation, they can just go back to their native countries where they speak the language and, can, and, and know the culture. Israel's not like that. I mean, Israel, there have been, Israelis have been there for generations now. They have their, their unique culture and, and you know, they're not going to go back to where they came from. And so, um, so it, it is. It, it is as it, um, um, I'm certainly not a Zionist. I certainly, uh, you know, don't. Um, I, I would. I, I would like to see a, um, a a democratic state, a single democratic state for everybody. I think it's important to to be clear that uh, Israelis, Jews, and do indeed have the uh, right to say to stay, not as a privileged group, not with more rights, uh, but with equal rights. Yeah, I, I would not think we are able to take all the questions. So feel free to say like stop for this. Let's get another five minutes. Yeah. So as long as you are. Um, no, I, I don't think uh, <laughs> I, I don't see anything physically moving Israel either. Uh, yeah, yeah. In the, in the pre, pre sixty seven, the British and the French were primarily the supporters of, of, of Israel, and the United States still want to take a more balanced position because we are interested in Arab oil. Uh, and, and the like, um, but um, again, that uh, uh, when Israel found, uh, but uh, you know, we we um, we've been kind of wanting to push the British and French out. You know, we eventually took over from the British in the Persian Gulf, for example, uh, when uh, uh, when Howard, Howard Wilson, the British Prime Minister, withdrew U.S. Uh, British security uh, commitments from anywhere east of the Suez, and as part of sort of the United States becoming the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the greater uh, outside hegemon. And we saw Israel as an important uh, vehicle to to go after the Soviets because, and that around that period, there are a number of pro-Western monarchs that are overthrown by these um, left-leaning nationalist um, um, uh, military regimes, and we saw Israel as an counter for that. Well, by the way, before me, people, before people leave, I do have an email list where I send my policy briefs and and articles every um, you know uh, once a month or so. If you want to be on that, you um, you can uh, sign. You know, sign up uh, here again. A lot of it is more U.S. Uh, based in terms of U.S. policy, um, but um, you're welcome to um, uh, to sign up anyway. Yeah. So let's just keep going on this. Wait. I want to focus on this. Um, um, <clears throat> why does Israel trust the United States? Well, the United States has been had their back, you know, consistently, even when uh, most of the rest of the world um, uh, uh, did not. And I think that's, um, um, and you know, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, Israelis with dual citizenship. I mean, uh, Netanyahu lived in the United States for seven years. Um, and that's why he has, has uh, he speaks such a uh, good English. In fact, I know some left-wing Israelis who 
who think he might actually be CIA because he had two different social security cards and other mysterious activities when he li lived there. Okay. Um, oh yeah, the civil disobedience. We're already seeing civil disobedience. We're seeing a lot of civil disobedience. And I mentioned uh, closing down major railroad stations in Philadelphia, Washington, New York, uh, the, the, the closing down the uh, Oakland, San Francisco uh, bridge um uh, uh near uh shutting down the highways leading to kennedy airport in new york i mean there's been a lot of uh civil disobedience occupation of the uh rotunda in the senate building in the united states yeah it, it, it's been quite um uh, quite remarkable i mean it took uh several years of the vietnam war before we had as many much civil disobedience as we've seen seen here so it, it's impressive and it's growing just like we take steps in there yeah, yeah actually i have uh, my question is regarding what you mentioned about like uh the right to return for both like uh, Palestinians yeah. and like uh, Israelians. I mean, according to international law, I, I'm studying like uh, right now uh, international law, human rights and social law. I mean, it's, it could be possible for both Palestinians and yeah. Israelis to get uh, back, both of them, to mm -hmm. their home. And especially according to the resolution 194, the Palestinians have the right to, yeah. to, to get back. And the majority in the Gaza population. They belong not to Gaza, they belong to what's called Yeah, they're descendants of uh, people, they're, they're, they're survivors or descendants of the Nakba from yeah. other parts of Palestine. Yes, under the <clears throat> Treaty of International Law in terms of human rights, everybody has the right to yeah. leave or return uh, from their country of origin. Yes. Excuse me, you're talking about the international law, but has Israel or U.S. accepted what the IAG's IAC, CG, uh, said? Okay. How did, did, did they accept what they well, in, in terms of a, a plausible, uh, plausible case for genocide. No, I mean, yeah, every, every. yeah. Basically, uh, the the, the um, well, the, in terms of the pre preliminary decision uh, the, uh, of the of the ICJ to that there was a plausible case, they're going to investigate it. The U.S. put a spin on it and said, "Oh, they didn't call for a ceasefire, and uh, they're going and, and they're going to be looking at it more." They ignored the fact that it made a very strong statement saying, "Yeah, sure, looks like it." You know, but we need to, uh, but but we need more investigation to make it official. So they put a spin on it. And again, the previous um, ICJ decision on the wall, they totally rejected and said was biased. But that was just an advisory opinion. So yeah, yeah. It, it, but again, the U.S. Has, has ignore is quite willing to ignore international law, and not just on Israel, but on, but on other issues. I mean, the U.S. rejected the World Court when, back in 1984 when it said the United States had no right to attack Nicaragua, mine its harbors bomb its oil facilities, and that was a unanimous decision, say, for the U.S. judge, and the Reagan administration ignored it. And when the U.N. Security Council voted to say, you have to abide by this, uh, the U.S. vetoed it. So again, the United States is, 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 has long been an international outlaw when it comes to uh, the world court and other things, international law. It's not just Israel. Yeah, we will take this last question, and we are sorry for this, but we like promise to be more lectures. And you are like welcome to, to come with questions. Keep on looking now. For yeah, no we're so social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We, we talked about that. Um. Yeah. Peace, peaceful social movements. Um. I mean, there has been an uh, a very active Israeli uh, peace movement. You've had a lot of Israelis who've gone to jail rather than serving the occupied territories. But a couple of things have happened. One, the shock of October 7th, you know, which was was, was, was really massive, really hit the Israeli uh, psyche, you know, frankly, very triggering for people who have you know, had the kind of history that Jews have had and things like that. Unfortunately, it really hardened Israeli attitudes, really moved, uh, you know, moved the politics to the right. And that was a major setback. But even before that, Israeli politics are going more to, more to the right. And part of it is this myth that the Palestinians uh, rejected a generous offer back in 2000. That was the spin that the US government gave to, to the Camp David meetings, things like that. It's a total rewriting of history. I could go into that, but that's gonna take some time. Um, but a lot of Israelis uh, bought into that myth. Uh, the rise of Hamas, you know, uh, you know it was, it was also very scary, not just because of terrorism, but because they're, they're Kind of reactionary uh, um, uh, Islamist or orientation, but the big thing is just demographically. More progressive, secular Israelis tend to have small families, um, and 
half their kids seem to be immigrating to Berlin and other places now because <laughs> um, they, they're a conservative, nationalist, ultra-religious Israelis tend to have big families. And uh, not 100%, but <clears throat> on average, uh, younger people embrace the politics they were raised with in their families. So it doesn't take long, especially given you know, the small size of Israel for that demographic shift. So while American Jews are moving more and more to the left, getting more and more critical to Israel, Israeli Jews are moving more and more to the right. And uh, that's, you know, that, that's another thing that's led you know, many of us to, to um, you know, kind of give up on a two-state solution, <laughs> you know, that uh, because they're only a minority of Israelis support a two-state solution now. And here's the big myth. People, uh, and this is another thing we hear, it drives me crazy hearing from Washington. Oh, it's Netanyahu's fault, Netanyahu's fault. There's going to be an election. <clears throat> as soon as the war is over, they'll boot up uh, Netanyahu. But I can't think of any conceivable coalition government in Israel that would be open to a two-state solution. You know, so um, it's not just Netanyahu. The so-called centrist parties, they might be open to calling something a state, but it's going to be a banter stand. <laughs> it's not going to be, you know, a viable uh, independent state. So um, and I, it pains me to say this, you know, because for years I was saying, you know, Oh, you know, these, these, all these progressive Israelis are realizing that this is bad for Israel in the long term. There are all these great dialogue groups. They're working with their account, uh, moderates in Palestine. I was, you know, I, was, I, was, I was a big, big booster. Uh, and, and in fact, I've written, written, I've written an entire book on nonviolent social movements, you know, and I've, you know, in the Arab Spring, and you know, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, social, uh, peaceful social movements guy, okay? <laughs> big supporter of nonviolent action. I've even done seminars around the world for pro-democracy activists on the history, uh, uh, theory, and dynamics of, of nonviolent action, things like that. So again, I, I, I'm, if I thought it would work, I would be promoting it. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to happen unless there is international pressure. And Israelis recognize that they cannot get away with this because, you know, if you ask me why does Israel do the terrible things it does, the number one reason I would give is because they can because they think they can get away with it. And, the, and, 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 and as long uh, and, and when the United States and other countries do what they did to South Africa <laughs> and impose sanctions and say, no, you cannot continue doing this, you're gonna have to accept majority rule. It was then and only then that FW de Klerk, the last white president agreed to do so. Actually, I had dinner with F.W. Clerk back in 2000 in Genoa, and he acknowledged this guy is an Afrikaner blue blood. His family had been there since the 1680s. His father was a, one of the architects of apartheid. You know, he's a, he's a, he, it's not like he suddenly saw the light and became a, became a liberal <laughs> and believed in equality. He was pragmatic enough to say, you know, when the sanctions came down, the business interests in South Africa and others said, hey, we can't go on like this. The gig is up. You're going to have to release Mandela. You're going to have to negotiate. You know? So I, 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 I think the really, and, 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 when, and, and, when, the press, and, and uh, when the pressure comes down, I think the Israelis have to compromise. And remember in South Africa, it wasn't the arms struggle that liberated them. And the ANC would occasionally blow up a pylon or attack a police station or whatever. But it was the civics. You know, it was the unions. It was, you know, the, 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 the resistance in the townships. It was, it was, it was that the internal resistance combined with international pressure. That's what brought down apartheid. So I, I, I think that um, uh, the, the trouble with, with, with the, the, the trouble, the whole Oslo formula is that it's very hard to have a nonviolent resistance when your occupier isn't actually physically occupying your area, is essentially surrounding you <laughs> in these little ghettos with, with uh, checkpoints and everything. You know, I mean, and, and part of the I, I also was, I mean, the first, I mean, the first intifada was a great model of nonviolent resistance. It was really, I mean, despite the iconic, you know, thing of, a, of the kids with the uh, uh, slingshots and whatever, 90% of, the, of it was, was nonviolent action, non-cooperation, strikes, boycotts, alternative institutions. But the, um, um, but, but, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Oslo thing, you know, took the wind out of that and kind of made the, the, the Palestine Authority jailers in their own prison. 
Um, and so, um, so again, you know, peaceful social movements, <laughs> I, I really, I, I think they can only happen if they have the outside support, which would come and come, you know, to this uh, through, you know, uh, pressuring Israel to make the necessary compromises for peace. Okay. It's up to you now. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Keep on look out on social media for more lectures. Yeah, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>